Hello there and welcome to another edition of Testimony Time with myself and Dawson. It's great to have your company here on Revelation TV. It's always such a blessing and a pleasure to see how the Lord has directed the paths of so many uh, of us. And that's a real blessing to all of us. We have in the studio today, we've got lovely Judith Nwakolo. I hope I've pronounced that yes, correct. I've been correct. kind of rehearsing that for <laughs> but a couple of hours at least. Uh, yeah. But lovely to have you in the studio, um, Judith. Now, we've been talking on the phone um, about your story, about what the Lord has done in your life. And really, uh, we just feel it's going to be such a blessing for you to share that um, with, the, uh, with the viewers. You come from quite, um, if I was to say troubled back background, that would yeah. probably be putting it mildly. Yeah. Um, but I really would like you to have a, a, an opportunity to, uh, today to really sh share with us what God has done in your life. And maybe we can start doing that by rewinding the clock back to early in your life. And if you just describe how you know how your childhood was you know if God had any influence in your life what you thought about God what was going on in your life up until the point where um, you met the Lord if we can start with that Judith tell us about yourself thanks um well the majority of my early years was spent in Nigeria where I was born I am um, was born to uh, my mom my dad and we there were eight of us. I was the only daughter. I had seven brothers. Wow. And I attended primary school, secondary school, uh, up onto third level. And, and was your family Christian growing up? We were, we, it was supposed to be Christian. We thought we were Christians. Uh -huh. And until um, later years in my life when I discovered that what I thought really was Christianity was actually cultism and more of a, um, a religion that kept you captive. Okay. Um, that kind of introduced you to the wrong God. In, in what way, How, tell us, just expand a little on that. In what way did it, did it sort of border on occultism? Yes. First of all, we were taught to shun every other Christian church, that we were the only true church in Nigeria, yeah. um, that all other religions were false except this, um, this one, this very one. And my father was uh, an elder in the, in the society and he preached in the meetings and we grew up into that faith. That was all we knew. And so what sort of things did you believe? Well, we believe. That now that you are a Christian, I mean, I'm kind yeah. of jumping forward here, but what sort of things in that cult do, would you say you believed that you no longer believe? Yeah. So like I, I wrote in my book, we believe that Jesus was a lesser God to, to right. the Father. We didn't believe in the personhood of the Holy Spirit. We didn't believe that women were, uh, would go to heaven. We didn't Gosh. believe, we believed that in the 144,000 only elect group of Christians that are heading for the, hev for the heavenly class. Um, we didn't fellowship with any other Christian uh, faith. If you did, it was considered interfaith. Right, so you would have been in serious trouble um, serious at that trouble. point. So that's, that's the background in terms of the family yes. that you were growing up in. There's a lot of abuse, and like I said, it started the program, a lot of sadness, and you had a very, very tough life. And mm -hmm. um, tell us about the abuse and, and how it began. Well, we were living in the city in Nigeria then, and we had moved to the village because my dad had lost his job. And there in the village, my mother died. And how and old were you when you? I was around died? seven. Seven. Yeah. Okay. We were eight then, eight children. Eight children. Your mother's just died. She just died. And okay, so what? What? How did the abuse then start? So within that period that my mom had died was like a couple of weeks after her death. I, my first recollection of my abuse happened one night when I, I went to spend the night with my father. I wanted to sleep with him because I felt so afraid. I mean, um, it was very hard for me during that time that my mother passed away. Uh -huh. So I couldn't sleep on my own. So I would go to my daddy and spend the night with him. So I, 
remember the night that the abuse began and um, and well, that was from seven years old yes how long did the abuse last so then that was the f when it be actually began then a few months after the death of my mom my father moved to the city and then he placed us in the care of my relatives and then he came back here yeah, like a year and a half um, then he came out with his partner and then all eight of us and he and his partner, we moved to Lagos. And then there's, and the abuse began again. So, yeah, you moved to Lagos with your family and then you, you talked about, um, well, certainly in your book, you talk about um, a lot of abuse happening in yeah. those years. Yes. Um, was this, t without being overly graphic here, but was it, did this just take the form of sexual abuse? Was there any other type of abuse going on? It was sexual abuse. It was sexual yes, abuse. Yes. And you, that started aged seven. Seven and a half. And, and how long did that continue? So here we are in Lagos. Uh, it was around nine now. Um, my father had his partner, but she wasn't regular. She was coming and going. And eventually, after a couple of months, she moved. She left. So then the abuse became more permanent. And yeah. then I, I spent basically every night with my father in the bedroom. And, did, and, and the only respite that you got from that was when he was in a relationship? Yes. So basically, um, if he was in a relationship, the abuse diminished. Diminished, yeah. And then didn't go away completely. Yes. But if he was not in a relationship, that's when he abused you. Exactly. Until what age, Judith? Until 13. 13. 13. That's, that's a lot. I mean, how was that for you? How did you cope with that all those years? It was hard. But I, I couldn't come to grasp with what took place with my father. Huh. And I had a lot of blame. I, took guilt. I, was, I felt so guilty. You see, a lot of people struggle to understand that, yet it's a common thread mm -hmm. between abuse within... Um, abuse itself, that a lot of the victims of abuse somehow interpret it, particularly when they're small children, they seem to think that it was their fault and that they feel guilty about yeah. that. Is the, that what yeah. you're... And then like I, it, like I felt like it was something that I did together with my father and uh, I partook of, yeah. of that guilt and I bore that, carried that. Did your father ever talk to you about the abuse? How did, did he tell you not to tell anyone or...? It was in a very playful way, so he would be like, oh, come and play with daddy, you know, so, which made it even worse yeah. for me, so for me to actually name it as yes. abuse. Yes. What about your, um, what about the rest of your siblings? What about your brothers and sisters? Did they know? So I was the only girl, so I didn't have sister. So my, my two oldest brothers would have been 18 and 21 around that time. They would have seen me and dad in bed, but did they, they didn't know? know? They didn't know. They didn't know. They wouldn't ever believe that yeah. something like that could happen. Okay. Wow. Uh, and how did it, you know, you said it, it went on until you um, reached age 13. Yeah. How did the abuse actually stop? Why did it stop when you were 13? What happened? Because he, he remarried. He got married. So, so the arrival of my stepmother ended right. my abuse. Okay, so uh, that, again, you know, this, this is absolutely awful. I mean, you know, throughout your time in Nigeria, in Lagos, with all of this happening, mm -hmm. you know, your brothers didn't know. Did you have anybody to talk to? Did, was there anyone that you, that you confided, confided in? No. There were many people, but there was not one individual that I could confide in. Okay. There was no such close connection. Okay, and um, then you, how far away are, are we at this point from when things with God started to happen? Tell us a little bit about how you got from there, mm. being 13, to meeting Jesus. Oh, so very long journey. Because then from 13, I finished my college, still bearing the, the burden and the, and the yeah. pain and then my physical body began to react. I would have temperature, I would have fever, with no medical, you know. Uh, this is why you were still in Nigeria? Well, I was still in Nigeria. And I talked more about those fever in, in my book. And then, then I went into 
third level. And then I still had those fever, I still had um, internal those struggles. Those physical issues. Yes, physical <coughs> issues. And I still had anxieties and, you know, I felt trapped. But I wasn't going to ever tell it to anyone. And wow. It was a secret that I never meant to share with anybody. So what happened after that? Take your time, Judith, that's fine. Just take your time. Just, uh, again, it's, it's obviously a, a very, very painful experience um, for you to talk about. Um, let's, let's just, let's try and leave that side of things um, for a few moments and, and let's move on to when God came into your life. When you were growing up, um, Judith, did you, did you believe in God? I mean, I know you were brought up in a church, but did you, I know, you, uh, and there was a distortion on the Christian faith, but did you believe that God was there? Did you, did you always have that belief? And, and yeah. if so, how did it become more real to you? When did, when did Jesus really become real to you? I'd always known that there was God. Yeah. But I couldn't connect with God. Uh -huh. And then while in college in Nigeria, I would sneak out, you know, the way you would sneak yeah, out to yeah. go to parties. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A bit of rebellion going on here. Sneak out to go to the church. Uh -huh. to the Christian fellowship. Wow. And I would yeah. experience the presence of God, but I couldn't find name for it. I, couldn't, uh -huh. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew it was God. And then eventually I came to Ireland and then I had my ultimate freedom to experiment. So what did that the feel Christian like? What, what did that feel like when you came to, um, just remind us again, you, you came to Ireland at what age were you when you so came? So I would have been my late 20s. Late uh, 20s. 2001. You came Ah, and it, 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 you, you know, you've described it's almost you've described this. It's almost like you know the the doors are flung open now, and you know you've got this sense of freedom yeah. that you yes. never actually knew never existed. Had. Yeah, you never so had it. So here I am. That uh, religion wasn't here in Ireland, so I said to my fa bad family, Ah, there is no that church is not our church is not here, so I'm going to have to go to other churches, and they warned me of my eternal damnation. If you ever get yeah. caught up in that, you know, yeah. the day of the Lord is coming, you know, yeah. stuff like that. But I was so disobedient because I had this internal um, pursuit to, to actually find God. And then yeah. I, when I attended Christian churches and if there were events, I I'd attended. Go. But then I would come back home feeling guilty as if I had betrayed God. And that is what, you know, being in a cult or even sometimes not being in a, in a cult itself, but yeah. being in a, a very um, restrictive, very yes. overly harsh religious environment yeah. can do, that the minute you, you step out, you feel as if you're betraying the God that you exactly. always knew. And God hasn't changed. He's yeah. still there. He's still there, but you never know. Whilst you're in it, yeah. until you come out of it. Yeah. So here I am, come visiting a church and then coming back home, and I, I will retrieve in a corner of my bedroom and go on my knees and ask God to forgive, to forgive me you. for going to church. But then my body will react. Um, because you had a lot of health lot of, issues. Yes, health issues. And yeah. you had to I visit feel, doctors. I feel my and, heart pounding yeah. to the point as if I'm going to pass out just because I had just returned from, from a church and that you could easily internalize that to be problem from the church, yeah. whereas it's the reverse. Yeah. And then, but I kept going because I, I was hungry for God. I wanted, to, I wanted to know God. And the people in the new church that you were going to now, mm. did, you, did you talk to them, not necessarily about the abuse, but did you talk to them about your feelings of guilt? No, because I hadn't truly trusted them to that point yet. So. I was experimenting. Yeah. I wanted to see what actually they believed in. So I didn't trust them to that point yet until in 2008. I was doing all that, playing churches with them, you know. And what happened in 2008? 2008, there Tell was it. a revival service. There was a revival? Service, a church in Nigeria had, right. uh, okay. was having a, an event in Dublin and then uh, a friend of mine invited me. He's actually a minister, so he would have um, visited my home and ministered to myself and my, my husband and I on various occasions. 
So he invited us, but my husband didn't go and I went. The moment I walked into that arena and something miraculously happened, I felt an inexplainable silence and peace within me. And I said, this got to be God. There is God here. And then was that the cutoff point, would you that say? Was it. And then I started to cry in the arena. Yeah. And then I felt so, so at peace. And that day I knew that this this is the real this is, deal. This is the real deal. Yeah, this is what it's this really about. This is the about. real deal, yeah. And then for two days, I would sit in the, in, in the sitting room, just quiet. And my and husband was, yeah, was wondering what had happened. Just that peace. And, and sorry, I'm kind of backing up slightly here, but your husband, um, how old were you uh, when you got married? And did he belong to the same... No, so, no. So I married in my late twenties. Around, uh -huh. tw I was around twenty-seven years old when I married. No, he was—he didn't belong to the cult. He—he he was supposed to be a born-again Christian. <laughs> well, you say the word supposed, <laughs> supposed to be, because so. that's what he said he was. Okay. Well, maybe that's what he believed he was. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he <laughs> believed he was, because then he's, he was—he was supposed to be a born-again Christian. But he joined the, the court because my father had told him, if you ever going to marry Judith, you need to be attending services and be right. active. So right. what was he supposed to do? <laughs> so he so when you, you had this um, experience in the arena and then he sees that there is a true change in you, is that when he then came forward to experience God for himself. And also, where is your father in all of this? I mean, what, what's going on with him at this Lovely. point? Lovely, yeah. So when I got married um, in, 2000 and, in 2000, 2000, 2001, my father moved to, to the States. Right. He moved, I think, in 2000 or 1999, I don't remember exactly, but he moved to the States and unfortunately, he, he was ill for an eight-year period. He went from one ailment to the other. His whole body, his system was kind of uh, um, incapacitated with different kinds of ailments. While I was here in Ireland, uh -huh. he was there okay. dealing with you know, his illnesses. And what was your relationship with him like? I still loved him at yeah. that time. Yeah. I've heard people talking about abuse, sexual abuse in Ireland was everywhere, was in the radios, in the news, and it came to a point, I was still like, uh, I love you, daddy, we yes, a daughter-father yeah. relationship for a period of four yeah. years, five years. Yeah. We were just communicating, talking on the phone. Yeah. The relationship was okay, just like it used to be, until five years after five years stay, living in Ireland after five years, when I heard people talking about it and, and I actually came to, to the point where I knew I could not run away with this. They're talking about me. Yeah. It felt that way, I felt that way. Then I named it what actually took place between my father and I. And you named it to him? It, no, not to him. To within yourself? Myself. Right, yeah. okay. That what actually took place between my father and I was not that I I slept with my father, or that I, I had any, um, that, or that I, I um, consented to any, you know, no. sexual. It was abuse. It was sexual abuse. Yeah. And that was my relationship with my father, severed at that moment. It affected our relationship. I could no longer have any conversation yeah. with him. I couldn't be able to hear him on the phone. Did you, did you confront him with it, or oh, was no, it just you no, pulled back? No, I haven't got to that yeah. point yet. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so for how, how, does that, how does that feel that you, do you feel you need to, or how, how I do felt you I needed to. Yeah. I had a lot of struggles and battles. I needed to tell him, I needed to pick up the phone and tell him, you abused me sexually. Yeah. You're not a good man, you're an evil man. Right. But I didn't have but you that didn't. power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It takes power. Uh, exactly. How has God helped you through this? How has the Lord helped you make sense of all of this and deal with it? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking, Judith, about something that in essence happened such a long time ago, but it 
obviously talking about it is very, very raw. And even though now you've come through the other side, you were in the arena, you've got the peace of God and everything's hunky-dory, you still have those memories, yeah. you still have to live with that. Yeah. How has the Lord actually helped you in that area? In the memories? Yes. Yeah, how the Lord has helped me in, in, in my memories is that he has actually healed those memories. He has healed the pain that came with those memories. And how did that happen? How did he do it? Because it, it could happen. be people watching. I like that... to say it happened all oh, miraculous yeah. love, but it didn't happen that way. Um, my healing actually began with medical interventions when my GP was referring me to the, to the, to the right clinics to go for my mental health. Um, and the church that I was in there, the spiritual counsel, the Lord was using all that. And then I did that 10 therapy. That's the Lord using all those means to, to sustain me within those very difficult times up until uh, five years ago when the Lord came and, and, and you know, and shifted, you know. My Tell us about that, because that's, that's <laughs> something you talk about and it's, yeah. it's, uh, that's really a blessing. Um, so share that with us just now, what actually happened five years ago. So five years ago, actually before five years ago, my father had died and then the memory came raw. Yes. It, don't forget, I never intended never to. never spoke, yeah. And I didn't ever intend to talk about it. My father is dead, he's dead, done. Yeah. But then I went through another phase of trauma. Yes. And then I wanted then to shout it to my whole family. That man there in the grave, Yes. he abused me. I wanted to shout it to the whole world. Ah. Because the one who had the power over my life, in that way, he was dead. Yes. And now uh, I felt that freedom. Yeah. And, and did you share it with your family? No, not until after he died. Yeah, but once, sorry, that's what I mean. Mm. Once he died, mm. that gave you the confidence then. The confidence, to, yeah. What was the reaction from your family? Well, they got a shock. They got a shock. Did you have any resistance? Did they, did they believe you? There's something interesting. They said, we've known you all our lives. They were talking to me when I shared my yeah, views. Yeah. You could never, ever make up something like this. Oh, wow, isn't that amazing? And they said, and besides, our father is dead. What is yeah. there for you to gain yeah. if you yeah. were to lie? Absolutely. That is definitely. <gasps> Gosh. You know, it was a very, very difficult moment, but there lied my healing. Part of my healing yeah. was to disclose it to my family, because I, then I felt a huge, uh, well, you would body, be he yes. heavy body after my father died. Yeah. Huge body than I felt while he was alive. Yeah. So, I mean, that in and itself is incredible. So your father has died. You've unloaded this burden um, that you've carried all your life. Um, the family know that you couldn't have made anything up. And then, you know, in the remaining moments, because we've only got a few minutes left, yeah. um, if you can just explain what the Lord did. Yes, yeah, so um, back to that back, question, back to, what did the Lord did? So done and here where I you was five years ago, my family at some stage, some members in my family didn't like to hear that. Yes. Okay, and the, the question is, they would never even like to hear that should my father have been alive, yeah, okay? Yeah, so yeah. there was not never gonna be a time yeah. that they would like to hear that. So I got a lot of persecutions from certain members of my family. Yeah. Five years ago, uh, I got caught up in a, a very heated conversation with some of my bad family uh, members. Yeah. And I found myself one afternoon, one afternoon, it was very sunny in, in Ireland. It rarely would you have sun in Ireland at that season. It was in April, February, five years ago. So it was a sunny uh, day in Ireland. In Ireland. In, yeah. When I had that conversation, and I came to the point that, like a grand zero, when I was crying and, you know, so bitter about the conversation and how my family perceived of me because of yeah. what happened to me. Yeah. And I, I felt I could no longer go on. But that was the right moment that God came and, and showed up. You know the way God comes and showed yes. up, shows up he in a situation? Up, yeah. He showed up in a very miraculous way with his presence. So you, had, you really felt a true sense of the presence of God yes. <clears throat> that really has kind of turned your life around. Yes. And um, again... And it came with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. So the presence yeah. of God 
with the relationship of, uh, with, with Jesus' relationship. And then he began step by step to remedy all that the enemy had done. And of course, your full story um, is in your book. Uh, Judith has uh, got her book out, Not in Chains, uh, Surviving Child Abuse. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, you're going to, for those of you that have uh, maybe experienced that or for yourselves, uh, you might actually want to look at that because that will give you a lot more detail than we've been able to um, cover in, in this short space of time. If there is somebody out there um, though, Judith, and they are, you know, they are carrying all of that guilt, the shame, mm -hmm. and everything that goes with it. Mm. You know, just in a in a in, in a few words, what would you yeah. what would you say to them? I say it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's never their fault. They were victims. Yeah. The very people or the very person that should have protected them has harmed them, but that God wants to take care of them. He will heal them. And they should never come to the place or point where they feel that uh, it's over. What for you is the best thing about that encounter with God five years ago? What's the mm. one thing that you think, my goodness, this has just changed everything? His presence. His presence. Do you yeah. have a, a real sense of that on a daily basis? Yes, I have. Without the presence of Jesus, I could never ever have been able to make it through. If I did, never to this point, never. It's, it's an incredible um, story of really how, how life can be so bad and dark and what the enemy can do to mm. keep you in that prison. Not just a prison of torture and despair, mm. but of loneliness. Yes. Because you don't want to tell anybody. But then when God's presence comes through and he shines his light no, on you, you, everything changes. changes Judith, thank yeah. you so much thank for sharing so your much, story. Uh, an absolute blessing to us all. We'll see you very soon for another testimony here on Revelation TV, Testimony Time. <laughs>